Super. Well, okay, everyone, welcome. This is the MIT Mobility Initiative Weekly Forum. Our regular host, Professor Jinhua Zhao, is traveling today. Uh, so I will be filling in for the role of host. I'm John Movenzade with the MIT Mobility Initiative. And my colleague, Bhuvan Adlori, will be handling the Q&A, the curation of your questions uh, that you enter into the chat function. Um, we have a very special guest today, uh, but before I introduce him, I just want to reinforce the norms for this forum that Jinwa typically talks about at the beginning, which of course is camera on, we want to see you, um, voice off, and uh, the key word to remember with this forum is engagement. So we ask you to please enter your questions and your comments into the chat. We do share those chat feeds with the uh, with our weekly uh, forum participants, and they do find the comments really very helpful, useful, interesting. So, so please uh, type in your your thoughts uh, as we as we go along. Uh, now, just to give uh, Matthias a, a sense of who's actually with us today, I see we're up to about 185 participants. Some of you have already done this. If you could just quickly type into the chat your organization, where you're, which organization you're with, and your current location. So let's see. I see, um, of course, MIT in Cambridge, Berlin, Seattle, uh, New Hampshire, Ros Argentina, uh, Poland, London, Vancouver, Canada, Montreal, Cambridge, Bogota, Chicago, Atlanta, uh, Nagpur, India, Denver, Colorado, Tokyo, Japan, Bern, Switzerland, Knoxville, Tennessee, Fargo, North Dakota. Fantastic. Okay, well, that is a quite... Uh, diverse group of participants as always. So as you can see, Matthias, we're straddling uh, multiple multiple time zones here. Uh, so um, I will do my best to uh, introduce uh, Matthias Winkenbach, who is the director of the MIT Megacity Logistics Lab and a principal research scientist at the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. His current research focuses on multi-tier distribution network design in the context of urban logistics and last mile delivery, urban freight policy and infrastructure design, as well as data analytics and visualization in urban logistics context. Dr. Winkenbach received his PhD in logistics and his master's in business with specialization in finance and economics at WHU, the Otto Weisheim School of Management in Germany. He also studied at the NYU School, uh, School of Business, the Stern School of Business in New York, as well as uh, Asher Say in Montreal, Canada. His doctoral studies focused on the optimal design of multi-tier urban delivery networks with mixed fleets. His work was closely linked to a research project with the French national postal operator, a friend to the, to the MIT Mobility Initiative. And we've had the pleasure of working together on several projects. Matthias, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the forum. The floor is yours. Thank you, John. Um, and I hope that my connection is isn't the problem here because you were breaking a little bit in between, <clears throat> and I I hope it wasn't on my end. But either way, welcome everyone. Thanks for having me um, um, in the in this uh, kind of uh, circle. And I guess today, before I start, this is not going to be a very technical talk. Uh, it, I basically wanted to give a bit of a broader perspective on how we currently see last mile logistics evolving. And it's evolving relatively rapidly. And I wanted to kind of pinpoint one or two topics that we believe are particularly relevant here and where my lab is also actively doing research in. Um, so let me quickly share my slides and then we can take it from here. And please feel free to ask questions in the chat. And then I guess Boban will probably mo moderate that. And if there's a recurring theme, um, feel free to also interrupt me during the presentation. But 
Yeah, uh, Junua asked me to come up with a very catchy title, and that was a few months ago, so I called it Last Mile on Steroids. There's nothing about steroids in this talk, um, but basically what I wanted to somehow kind of get across in this talk is that we have to connect multiple things to actually design the future kind of last mile logistic systems that uh, we will all be experiencing as, cons experiencing as consumers, for instance. And that is connecting human knowledge, human experience with what machines can nowadays do and basically advanced algorithms, AI, that ideally try to connect um, the other two. But before I go into the details of this presentation, um, <clears throat> let me start with a few, sorry, I have a bit of a cold, with a few high level thoughts. Um, one is, and, and these thoughts will basically guide you through this entire presentation, but first thought is last mile logistics is still probably the key value driver for especially the e-commerce uh, uh, industry. And most importantly, is a key value driver in the kind of on-demand economy that we're in, where everything needs to be available, basically ad hoc, when people order it, whenever they, pe people feel the need for a certain product, it needs to be available. So that kind of on-demand mentality is only possible to address for the e-commerce industry through appropriate last mile um, logistics systems. The second thought throughout this presentation is that, um, I mean, obviously all of you have probably played around with ChatGPT lately, but I think we're at a point where we can safely say that apart from all the very good and important work that has been happening over the last couple of decades in the, on the OR side of things, so when it comes to optimization methods and the like, probably the biggest frontier of disruptive last mile innovation, and therefore probably also the biggest frontier for kind of disruptive future research in last mile logistics is AI. Um, and um, what personally I would like to see though, is that we don't just see AI as something that will eventually replace human capabilities in last mile logistics systems, but rather as something that can augment uh, what humans basically can do and what humans also do physically within last mile logistics operations. Um, the third point, I mean, we love to talk about drones. We have been talking about drones for many years. In a way, drones is just a placeholder for all sorts of autonomous technologies, be it delivery robots, be it kind of uh, assistive uh, technology for humans that are doing some sort of physical task in a last mile logistics system. But for this talk, let's talk about drones and how they can actually boost last mile um, productivity and flexibility, but also what they cannot do and what they will likely never be. And um, for the example of drones, for instance, here, the high level thought is we don't see them as a standalone customer facing solution in last mile logistics. We do see them again as something that could complement existing networks, could complement existing delivery models. And I'll, I'll show, show you a few examples for that in a bit. And then taking basically all of this together, taking a step back uh, and thinking about, okay, where does the last mile logistics industry actually need to go from an R&D perspective? Um, we believe that um, innovation needs to be addressed a little bit more holistically than it is being done right now. So a lot of last mile logistics R&D is still going very much into one single direction. Like let's find the next best routing algorithm or let's find the next best vehicle technology that we want to use in last mile distribution. But basically what we want to bring these different perspectives together. And most importantly, we believe that it's not always just an either or decision. For instance, it's not just AI versus human decision-making. It's not just drones versus the good old ground delivery vehicle. It's usually um, a combination of these technologies, a combination of these methods that can yield the best results for last mile logistics design. But first of all, um, why do we um, even care? Um, and I guess I found this really interesting quote um, in a recent report by McKinsey uh, saying that retail has experienced more change over the past five years than in the prior 50. And that is probably true. I would just add retail logistics has experienced more change over the past five years than in the prior 50. So um, there's a lot of very dynamic developments going on in the retail industry in particular predominantly driven by e-commerce, obviously. And um, there's a lot of pressure to create superior value, not just to consumers, but also to businesses and society as we basically enter this next stage of uh, online commerce, retail and omnichannel distribution. And that's why we need to 
basically fundamentally rethink about how we design lost my logistics systems and also how we best leverage again humans technology and algorithms to make that work um some of you probably have known seen this before to some of you have even talked about this before i just want to very briefly wrap up like what are the main pressures that the logistics industry is currently facing uh, kind of in light of a trend towards faster, more flexible e-commerce uh, uh, distribution. Um, and one big trend is obviously driven by us, driven by the consumers. Consumers today typically demand instant gratification, and it's pretty hard for delivery services to actually keep up with that. Like while a couple of years ago, we all were happy with receiving things, I don't know, two, three, four days after having placed an order online, that mentality is changing. More and more people are just getting used to the fact that if I order something online today, I'm going to get it tomorrow, if not today. And um, there's also economic reasons why many retailers want to push um, for um, the ability to deliver more frequently, to deliver faster, and to deliver through more than just a traditional physical retail channel, but basically to enter the omni channel space. Because there's several studies that show that omni channel consumers purchase more frequently and they buy more they buy higher value products and so a vast majority of retailers is actually looking into investing into superior deliver delivery capabilities particularly to their online clients right now we're talking mostly about companies investing into next day delivery capabilities but i'm relatively certain that in a couple of years from now we will mostly be talking about same day and potentially sub same day delivery services the challenge with that is if you just think about it, think of the US as a market. And if you wanted to serve the US as a market with something like a three day delivery time, you could basically reach about 80% of the US population within three days out of just three big distribution centers scattered across the country. So, very centralized distribution. If you move to a delivery speed of next day delivery and you still want to reach 80% of the US population, you would already need more than 90 fees to achieve that. And now if we take that one step further and think about things like same day delivery or sub same day or even instant delivery, it's clear that this can no longer be sustained by a centralized distribution system as we know it, but more and more companies are basically now investing into decentralized networks. So multi-tiered distribution networks where you probably still have big stock holding facilities somewhere in the middle of nowhere, but where actually the most most of the fulfillment process is happening quite close to the consumer already. So you have a highly fragmented distribution network, therefore also highly fragmented inventories and a much more complex system and to manage and to optimize. And that's where from a logistics research point of view, also a lot of existing methods currently start failing because they were just not designed for this level of complexity and fragmentation. Um, no. My slides got stuck. There you go. The next thing on this list is actually kind of related to also delivery speed, but also delivery consistency or reliability. Because there's more and more evidence um, for the fact that customers no longer want things fast, uh, no, not only want things faster and more flexibly. They also want more certainty around that process. They want to have more certainty around when exactly they're going to get their delivery. They want more kind of certainty around whether that delivery is going to be successful or not, whether the driver that's doing the delivery, for instance, is the same one that used to serve that customer the day before. Um, so this is a lot about how can we make last mile delivery service not just faster, but also more reliable. And the problem here is that as we move away from, let's say, a proprietary distribution by the big e-commerce retailers out there, as we move closer towards what we would call the gig economy, so we see more and more crowdsourced delivery services, for instance, one big element basically gets missing that would usually be for reliability and, uh, uh, and consistency, and that is driver familiarity. So there's many studies that show that if a driver is familiar with a certain route territory, that driver can deliver to those customers more efficiently, more reliably, and also more safely. Now, if we move to a gig economy where basically it's every time it's a different person delivering to a certain customer or to a certain area, that familiarity gets lost. And here's where, again, algorithms need to be developed that kind of leverage data to basically compensate for the lack of driver familiarity 
with a certain delivery zone. Not surprisingly, all of this puts a lot of pressure on cost um, of distribution um, services, but also on productivity. So to give you an example, we've been working with large food delivery networks in India over the last couple of years. And one of their struggles was obviously, how do we make food delivery more cost efficient? But the even bigger struggle was, how do we find enough drivers or delivery people to actually keep up with the rapid growth in um, demand. And that's honestly true pretty much across the entire e-commerce uh, industry where there's just a consistent lack of skilled workforce. So a lot of work has also to go into the question, how do we leverage the existing assets that we have, the existing vehicle, the existing driver uh, crowd more effectively? How do we make these people more productive while not jeopardizing on things like safety and reliability? And last but not least, sustainability is no longer just a buzzword, but is actually a credible business objective of many of the companies that we work with. While a couple of years ago, there was always some statement about sustainability in the research statements that we basically created before starting a research project, it was often just a lip service. There was often not a lot of real commitment behind a kind of a sustainability objective in the work that we did together with industry, and that has changed dramatically over the last couple of years. I mean, we've all seen the Climate Pledge Initiative where hundreds of companies have by now pledged to become carbon neutral by 2040, basically representing a huge fraction of the US economy too. And um, so there is a credible uh, uh, commitment to becoming more environmentally friendly. Um, the big challenges here from a logistics industry point of view is obviously technological uncertainty. The sheer cost of transitioning very capital intensive assets from traditional technologies to less carbon intensive technologies. And then obviously also, especially right now, a rather unclear economic outlook. So here, a lot of research has to go into how do we basically alleviate some of that uncertainty? How can we provide companies with the right models to basically um, uh, work around the uncertainty that they see around technology, around cost, around economic potential of these technologies? So that's just a level set, like um, like why why are we even doing research in this space and why are there so many interesting problems to solve? Um, in this talk, since we have just a little bit of time, I want to dive into two very popular topics. One is AI and machine learning and how they could help us in last mile logistics. And the other one is, as I said, drones or robots, autonomous technology in general. How could that type of technology help us build the future last mile logistics systems? Let's dive into AI or machine learning. First, and as I said before, we, we, we strongly believe that AI, at least in our industry, isn't there to fully make human decision-making redundant. Uh, rather, we see it as yet another tool to help humans make better decisions and probably make them faster, incorporate more information, but there's going to be still a human in the loop. A very good example for um, one of these systems is actually a project that we recently concluded um, with one of our industry partners in the fashion retail industry. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but they were basically facing the problem that they wanted to enable something like one to two hour delivery from their store network in major cities around the world. In our case, we've mostly focused on New York. And that's a perfect example for uh, something that many retailers go through right now, kind of this transition from being a, a pure brick and mortar retailer to becoming an omni-channel retailer. So actively opening the online channel as a sales and distribution channel and trying to basically integrate these two channels, both the physical and kind of the digital channel. And as we are talking now, no longer about delivery speeds like two, three days, but we're actually talking about on-demand delivery. So in this case, we were looking at a customer placing an order now and us guaranteeing that that order would get delivered within the next two hours. So here we're obviously talking, as I said before, of a highly fragmented distribution system where inventory can no longer live like 50, 40, 50, 60 miles outside of the city, but inventory has to live very close to where the consumer is. And the question is, obviously, how do you design these networks? How do you decide, in this particular example, which stores within the city of New York to activate for this service? Which capacities in the back room of these stores to actually reserve, not for the brick and mortar, like the walking customers, 
but for the online customers of this company, which inventories to potentially share between those two channels and how to dynamically adjust these allocations over time as, for instance, there's a, a change in, in market behavior, there is a holiday coming up, and therefore demand patterns changing dramatically. And in a situation like this, traditional last mile distribution network design problems and methods typically fail because they make very strong assumptions about the problem being linear, for instance, there not being any nonlinear effects, which is true if you are in the good old centralized distribution world, but it's no longer true if you're trying to optimize over a highly fragmented network, because then at every single store, you're facing highly nonlinear effects, for instance, related to inventory, but also related to capacity planning. Think of a, a store that gets too many orders that basically pile up in a queue. So you're basically having a queuing problem and modeling these linearly is, is not that easy anymore. So um, what we did here is we kind of for the first time combined our traditional tool sets from the OR world with a new tool set from the machine learning uh, uh, world. So we basically said, okay, there's no way we can model this problem to the level of accuracy that we would need by just relying on an OR model, so on an optimization model. So we need to make very radical simplifications to, to make this work on the OR side. So we built a highly simplified optimization model that would solve the model, uh, that would solve the problem very roughly. So that would give us a solution to the problem, but a solution that would probably not perform very well because we had to make very strong assumptions that would not hold true in reality. For instance, we would have to just assume that linear uh, that inventory requirements and capacity requirements at the, at the stores would behave linearly in the amount of demand faced by these stores, which is not true in reality. So we use this simplified OR model to generate solutions. And then we basically plug that into a very detailed simulator. So we built a very fine grained simulation model that would actually simulate the city of New York in this case for the duration of an entire day. We would show how orders come in dynamically, how they would get allocated to the stores, how they would get fulfilled, so picked, packed, and shipped in these stores, how the courier vehicles would move through the city, serve the customer. And throughout this entire simulation, we obviously generated a lot of data. We generated a lot of data about how we think this type of solution would perform in the real world. And that data then also reveals where our optimization model was off. So we, for instance, could see that in a certain store, our optimization model just allocated too few people for the picking and packing of online orders. So we established too little capacity. So, and that's where machine learning came into play. We basically built a relatively basic machine learning model that would identify these bottlenecks in the simulation data and would basically identify, for instance, which stores would need to get a higher allocation of capacity or a higher allocation of inventory of a certain product. And then based on these insights, the machine learning model would suggest new parameters for our optimization model, which we could then run, run again to get a new solution, which would hopefully already perform a little bit better in real world than the previous one. And so this kind of iterates, it's an iterative process, optimization doing its thing, simulating, and then learning from the simulation. So basically combining all three methods into one big um, model that then eventually helped us inform this company as to um, yeah, how they should design their last mile distribution networks for this particular highly challenging service um, in New York City. So this is a very good example of a relatively basic use of machine learning in our space. A more kind of, I would say, cutting edge approach to machine learning or AI in our um, industry is actually concerning routing. And this is where it's getting a little bit more interesting for us because what I showed you before, the network design thing, that is kind of machine learning alongside optimization. And that has been done by now several times. It's well established in the literature. It's still a great method, but I wouldn't call this the, 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 the cutting edge anymore. The cutting edge really is trying to get rid of optimization or of our methods um, altogether in designing last mile logistic systems. And honestly, when we talk about designing last mile systems, we are very much talking about solving combinatorial optimization problems. And the perfect example for a combinatorial optimization problem is the routing problem, the vehicle routing problem. There's decades of research on how to optimally solve 
vehicle routing problems. And um, honestly, state-of-the-art methods from the OR world are pretty good. So it's really challenging to basically set out and say, okay, we want to solve the vehicle routing problem, but without optimization. We want to do it with a machine learning-based approach. And we want to basically achieve competitive um, results from, from that method. Um, and this is ongoing research. So this is very much work in progress right now, but one of my students is currently working on this uh, in depth. And we kind of realized, well, in a way, if you think about what, what it really means to navigate on a map, so to find a good route that connects a bunch of customers, it very much has a lot of similarities with learning how to speak, basically learning kind of the inherent grammar of what a good route or bad route sequence looks like is kind of similar to learning the inherent grammar of how you basically find the right order to words to form a, a, a meaningful sentence. So that's on a 30,000 foot level why we were started looking into transformer models in particular and other large language, more, other method, methods that are mostly known to people from the large language model world um, to use them for routing. And um, so the idea here was, well, some of the features that give these methods um, kind of an advantage when it comes to natural language processing might also enable them to actually solve combinatorial optimization problems, such as routing problems quite well. One is kind of the concept of having self-attention. As I said, I don't want to, and in this case, I also probably can't go into a lot of technical detail, but um, Self-attention is a mechanism that actually helps us consider the relationships between stops. So for instance, how far apart are two different stops or what's the traffic looking like between these two stops? Um, positional encoding, basically uh, making sense of kind of the, the sequence in which stops are visited and in like basically incorporating that order information of the stops. So basically we move from stop A to stop B to stop C incorporating that into the solution process. And then having a layered architecture that is able to capture more complex relationships between stops as we move from layer to layer. A lot of these properties that are very helpful in language processing are also quite helpful in uh, combinatorial optimization. And as I said, this is work in progress. We're very, very early stage in this, but we're seeing some promising results here and um, hope that we can actually kind of present some more details on this probably sometime later this year. Uh, either at the usual conferences or through an academic publication. Um, the second <laughs> thing that I wanted to talk about briefly in this talk is the potential of drones and other autonomous technology in last mile logistics. And similar to AI, we again don't think that there's really that one vehicle technology out there that has the potential to fully replace or substitute existing solutions. But a lot of our research actually suggests that it's more like a complementary element to modern last mile logistics systems. So let's look into the example of drones in a little bit more detail. And if you think about, let's say drone delivery, at first, everybody is excited about it because it's just cool to have drones flying through the air autonomously, landing in front of your uh, house, dropping off your Amazon packages and kind of conceptually, that's a, a neat idea. But um, when you kind of think a little bit harder about it, some, at some point reality sets in and you realize, well, A, flying drones is really hard from a technological point of view. But apart from the technology side of things, the even harder thing to do is to fly them legally and to fly them in a way that you're actually cost competitive. <laughs> so um, we've been working quite a few years now on this topic with folks like UPS and others. And the bottom line of our research is the regulatory hurdles that are associated with doing commercial drone delivery to the end consumer at scale are just extremely high. Right now in most markets, both in North America and Europe, there isn't even a clear regulatory framework for this kind of service yet. So a lot of this is still kind of in the process of being written. And that obviously adds a lot of uncertainty as to when and if we will ever even be able to see this happen at scale. Um, but apart from all the regulatory concerns that are out there, the even bigger question to us is, is this really a desirable service from both a social and an environmental point of view? Um, and probably in both cases, the answer is no. Because if you're thinking about a highly fragmented 
um, consumer base and most of e-commerce volumes go to consumers, not to businesses. So we're talking about individual package deliveries to pretty much any household, let's say in the US. Doing this at this scale would mean we have hundreds of thousands of drones flying around at any point in time, which is hard to control, but also not necessarily a nice thing to think about if you want to maintain the livability of cities. It's not really desirable to have the sky buzzing of drones, apart from all the safety related issues that it might create. But also from an environmental point of view, moving things up in the air, keeping them there, moving them to your uh, customer through the air is the most energy intensive way that you could possibly deliver a package. So unless you are in full control of where the energy for that actually comes from, and at least today we aren't, and this is also not an environmentally um, friendly solution, even though it might look like one. But probably for most of the companies that think about this, the most striking argument why this is not a solution at scale is actually unit economics. And again, this is kind of on a very high level summarized from one of our research projects. We looked at, well, what would be the unit economics of a, the most basic drone delivery model out there, where you would basically just take a parcel center and equip it with an arbitrary number of drones and fly parcels to customers from the parcel center. And we, we simulated various different uh, scenarios here. We looked into different possible realizations of the regulatory framework. So right now, for instance, we are in the bottom right of this chart. So we are today and we are in a very severe regulatory environment. And so we, 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 we relaxed the regulatory constraints on the problem and we looked into the future to the extent that we could and made some kind of projections about, well, how is technology going to evolve? So for instance, how is autonomy going to evolve? How are component costs go going to evolve in the next 5, 10, 15 years? And for all of these scenarios, we ran very detailed drone routing models with a very realistic energy consumption module inside of them, for instance, to really understand the detailed cost of what it would take to deliver a standard e-commerce package to your door. And what you see here is basically three things. First of all, we can basically already exclude the left side of this chart because we will never be living in a world where there is no regulatory constraints or just minimal regulatory constraints. And I say never quite confidently here because this service is just too dangerous to not regulate it. Because if this thing falls out of the sky, it hurts someone really badly. So we will always be in that moderate to severe spectrum. And then if you look at the time horizon here, within the next five to 10 years, we will always end up in the death zone. We will always end up in a zone where unit economics are way beyond what they are with traditional ground-based delivery models. So it really only gets economically interesting in a time horizon between 10 and 15 years. And that's already a kind of timeline where there's also so much uncertainty around how different component costs and the like might evolve that these predictions are taken are to be taken with a very big grain of salt. So bottom line is, at least in the foreseeable future, we just don't see this happen at scale. What our research suggests could happen at scale though, is again, models where we don't see the drones as kind of a, a pure play solution that goes from the origin of the shipment all the way to the final recipient. So to the consumer in our case, but where the drones play more of a complementary role to existing delivery models. And one way this could look like is, for instance, enabling companies like UPS, FedEx, you name it, to make the most of the assets that they currently have, because these companies have buried millions of dollars into physical infrastructure for the type of delivery model that they're running today, which is basically a hub and spoke system and in that hub and spoke system, everything runs kind of on a periodic schedule. So if you if you want to know what that means is if, if you are, for instance, with UPS, you will see that every morning, I don't know, between 6 and 8 a.m. at any given parcel center throughout the country, you will see a huge line of UPS trucks lined up and parcels are being sorted and loaded into these trucks. They leave by, I don't know, 8.30, 9 a.m. in the morning. And once they're gone, they're gone. And they're not gonna come back to that parcel center anytime before the late afternoon. What that means is that system is currently not equipped to support things like sub same day delivery. So if there is for whatever reason, a significant volume of parcels coming in, let's say only at 11 a.m. or at 1 p.m., 
And these parcels would need to be delivered on the same day. With this current infrastructure and system, these companies won't be able to do it. The only way to do it would be to basically put them on dedicated vehicles and send these dedicated vehicles in as kind of rushed courier delivery, which is possible, but A, not very efficient, not very environmentally desirable, and also extremely costly. So here the question is, could drones actually help us leverage these existing systems? And even though they are somewhat static um, hub and spoke architectures, can we use drones to create more flexibility? So a way to think about this is, for instance, using drones as a resupply vehicle to ground vehicles that are already doing their tour. So here you see an illustration of that where a ground vehicle that leaves the depot in the morning is doing its thing delivering to customers and then there are certain dedicated locations in the field <laughs> in the field and these are denoted as transshipment points here that the vehicle so the ground vehicle can visit and meet with a drone that would resupply it with additional parcels so parcels that came in later throughout the day dynamically for other customer groups for other service speeds and it would pick them up from the drone and then continue its route with basically an extended effective capacity because suddenly it had got an intra route resupply of additional volumes. And that is a model that is a serving a real need. It is basically providing more flexibility to the established distribution infrastructure and the established distribution model of pretty much all current parcel uh, delivery services. And it is making the use of drone technology more realistic, also from a regulatory point of view, because suddenly you're not just serving kind of any random consumer that could be anywhere in the field, but you're serving clearly defined routes from a depot to a clearly defined set of transshipment points. So you're basically you're flying the same mission over and over again, which is not easy but to get approval for, but much easier than getting approval for individual deliveries to individual consumers. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry, my cold is kicking in, but um, another way to think about drones as a potential interesting technology in this field is um, looking at larger vertical takeoff and landing uh, 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 vehicles, let's call it cargo drones for now, that don't just carry one, two, or maybe a handful of parcels, but actually a large number of parcels. So think of the ideal case where you could basically put the entire load of a FedEx truck into the cargo compartment of one of these drones. And that drone would actually fly from a parcel center somewhere outside of a city into the busiest areas of the city and meet the ground delivery vehicle there. Why is that interesting? Well, if you look at uh, cities like Manhattan, for instance, you will see that Many parcel delivery services right now serve up to spend more than 30% of their productive time every day just in traffic, getting into and out of their service area. So, for instance, a car that needs to go from the parcel center outside of Manhattan into the busiest part of Manhattan can spend up to 30% of its route time just getting from the depot to the service center. There's obviously lost time, lost productivity. And that's where Drone technology could again be much more useful because it would address an immediate pain point. It could overcome this highly congested inbound and outbound leg and allow the actually productive unit, so the delivery vehicle on the ground, to start being productive not just at 10.30 a.m. by the time the ground vehicle would have finally reached its service area, but at 8.30 a.m., so um, allowing for better customer, better delivery reliability, better delivery speeds, and honestly, also just lower costs because of there being more time available for that uh, asset to be um, productive. So this is kind of our high level view on these two things. Once on the technology side, drones and other autonomous technology could be could be a way to design the future last mile logistics systems, could be the steroid that these systems need to basically keep up with what consumers need but not as a pure play solution, not as a single technological solution that does it all, but rather as something that complements existing systems. And same thing, AI has a lot of potential on the algorithmic sides. AI and machine learning might be what we really need in order to be, even be able to design the, and also manage future last mile logistics systems. 
but not as a standalone solution, but always tying in the human. And that's kind of the last couple of slides that I want to talk to in this, uh, uh, talk about in this session. Um, <laughs> because my other hat at MIT is I'm, I'm leading the, the CAVE lab, the Computational Analytics Visualization Education Lab, where we work with people in a very visual way. We basically connect all these fancy machine learning and optimization models that we build with human decision makers from our industry partners through visualization. And one of the main reasons we do this is because we feel like the more powerful the algorithms get that we build, the more powerful the models get that we build, and the more data hungry these models and algorithms become, the more there's a disconnect between what these models are actually able to do and what humans are able to appreciate. There's a disconnect between the potential of these models and methods and the human ability to make use of that potential. And we're trying to bridge that gap through basically providing a better interface between the two, making it more natural for humans to interact with advanced analytical tools. And the reason why we do this is because human experience is important. Human experience in the supply chain logistics domain cannot just be replaced, cannot just be encoded in um, a model. But there will always be a certain element of context awareness and experience by people who have been in this industry for decades that would be valuable to keep as part of the decision-making process. So basically to keep the human in the loop of the algorithm. And that's where, in this case, visual interfaces are very helpful, but um, which also get, basically gives rise to my general call to the logistics industry, but also to the research community that when we think about the future of last mile and research in this space, we shouldn't just focus on one type of method. We shouldn't just focus on one type of technology, but the real deal is the connection between all of this. So for instance, on the methodological side, yes, we can go on for another few decades just thinking about OR methods and making them faster and better and I don't know what. We can also jump full into the machine learning, deep learning AI world and say, okay, that's where most of the really interesting research work is happening right now. So let's focus on this. But by doing either of these two things, we would actually lose track of solving the real problem and solving the problem that real humans and real companies out there actually have. So we think research should very much focus on hybrid methods. How can we combine the best of both worlds, the OR world and the deep learning world? Um, similarly, how can we keep the human in the loop? How can we design algorithms that are very powerful, but don't just fully replace human decision making, but actually bring in that human experience, give the human kind of the ability to give feedback to an algorithm, give feedback to a model, evaluate model solutions naturally, very quickly, and basically be part of this decision finding process. And here, let's say, for instance, the Cave Lab is already doing quite a lot of work on the UI UX side, so mostly finding visual cues that help a human interact with an OR model. And we think in the future, we want to uh, put a little bit more effort, effort on actually the, the language side of things. So that becomes mostly important when we want the human to also be able to more naturally interact with um, artificial intelligence or machine learning models. Um, visualization doesn't really help you with that. You really need to be able to have like a, a language connection between the human and the model. Think of ChatGPT. That's the perfect example for, for such a language-based connection. And so there's a lot of really interesting methodological work that could go um, into designing the future last mile logistics systems. And um, yeah, that's why personally, I am very excited about the next couple of years of research that uh, we're going to do at the lab and at uh, MIT as a whole. And we are obviously hoping that this also finds enough attention in industry and with our academic community to basically form the right projects, form the right teams, um, and, and get this research off the ground. And with that, I think I'm done, and I probably went a little bit over time, but this was like my general view on where last mile logistics might go in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthias. That was, that was a great talk. Uh, I, I want to start by just uh, double clicking on your final trend, which was sustainability. It's not just lip service anymore. So it, interesting, I was, I was watching a, a talk from a, an executive at Amazon, and she said, look, in the United States, transportation is about one third of greenhouse gas emissions, and logistics, 
goods mobility is about one third of that. And last mile is about one third of that. So by, you know, the relation, what they're doing with their project with Rivian to electrify the delivery fleet for Amazon, you know, will have a real impact. Now that's, that's on the supply side. What I want to ask you about is the mobility demand side. Uh, so the question is really about, you know, this instant gratification trend that we've seen. Um, and do you see that we could potentially price that, you know, so we could implement the, the, the retailers? Have you seen movement among the retailers to effectively price in? Well, look, if you want to order your toothpaste at eight o'clock in the morning, and then you remember, oh, wait, I need mouthwash at noon. And then just before bedtime, you remember, oh, by the way, I need a toothbrush and put in these individual orders, which, of course, you know, further put further demand on the system. Is there a way to price that, number one? And do you think that consumers are willing to pay for that, number two? Um, to answer number one, yes, there are ways to price that. Um, the question though is whether anyone wants to price it uh, because i mean even if the consumers would be willing to pay for it and by now i would be skeptical about that because let's say we are all used to getting it for free or more or less for free by now and i don't think that it's going to be super popular to suddenly start charging for it again but even if people were willing to pay for it, uh, pay for it let's assume that for a moment i don't think there's going to be a lot of companies who would want to charge for it for the very simple reason that right now this ability to provide that level of service that level of flexibility that level of speed is kind of the key differentiating factor between some of the big players like most notably amazon and the long tail of the rest so the it's a it's an entry deterrent mechanism mechanism basically because if you do not have the volume and the scale of someone like amazon or maybe walmart or i don't know you can't do this cost effectively because this is a pure scale game. If like, for instance, 2019, I think it was Nike announced, okay, we're, we're going to stop selling directly on Amazon. We're going to do, we're going to double down on our own online channel. And yeah, from a branding point of view, it makes total sense. But from a logistics point of view, that's a nightmare because even the huge brand like Nike will, will not have the volume. And that means will not have the density of customers that would allow them to keep up with these types of service levels in a way that's even remotely cost efficient, cost effective. So, um, long answer to your question, but I think, yes, it should be relatively easy to price this, but there's not a lot of willingness to prices price it, neither from the consumer side nor from the uh, retailer side. Yeah. Yeah, well, hopefully a starting point on that is just raising awareness among consumers about the, the consequences uh, of so their of actions. I, I, I forgot to mention that. So we did do, well, not my team, but one of our other teams at CTL did a study two or three years ago with a retailer in Mexico, where they actually experimented in their live system, so on their online store, um, whether people would be willing to go for a slower delivery service uh, if they not had to pay for it, uh, if so they didn't charge for the faster service, but they basically said, okay, if you go for the lower service, that's going to save a hundred trees. So they made it very tangible, but they didn't monetize it. And that was actually interesting to see that it was quite an effective lever to make people aware mm -hmm. of the environmental impact and reconsider, well, apart from my own financial situation or the, the economic impact that this might have, what am I doing to the environment by this? And do I really need this service? So that is, I think, the more effective way to think about it. I have one more quick question before turning it over to Bhuvan. And it was related to your point about the proliferation of micro-fulfillment centers in cities and how do we position last mile facilities, storage within, within cities. I, I, my question is, you know, if you had you know, 10 city mayors in the room asking you for advice or perhaps real estate developers, what, what would you tell them? What would you tell them about the fabric of the city, more from an urban design and planning perspective uh, to look for going forward into the future? Yeah. I mean, I'm not an urban planner or a real estate guy, so they might have different answers to this. But 
pro if I was talking to a city, I would basically ask them to think about the current land use within that city and think about the spaces that they think are currently generating the least amount of revenue per square foot, basically. So what is the basically least value generating use right now of space in your city? And that's literally for any space, not commercial space, like any space, be it office space, uh, um, uh, um, apartments, parking lots, you name it. Because these spaces, regardless of their nature, will probably be the ones that are most likely going to be replaced by logistics activities in the future. Because these micro fulfillment centers, I mean, in an ideal world, you would obviously want to build a tiny little highly automated warehouse from scratch, but in most densely populated cities, that's not a reality. You do not find an empty lot in the middle of Manhattan that is just waiting to become a warehouse. That's not happening. So it's a lot about repurposing existing space, repurposing parking garages, for instance, but also, quite frankly, repurposing space that might have previously been a retail store or that might have previously been an office now that everyone's working from home or in the more, most unfortunate event might have previously been an apartment. So if, if um, cities want to understand the impact of these micro fulfillment centers or like hyper local fulfillment in general, they should think about which spaces are the most likely to be replaced. And do I want that from a political point of view, from a societal point of view? So if it's, for instance, the apartments, that might be a problem. If it's parking lots, that might actually be desirable. And so um, I think from a policy point of view, that's the most interesting angle to this. Super. We, I'm going to turn it over to Bhuban. OK, uh, super interesting talk, Matthias. We've got a ton of questions on sustainability as expected. So John touched on, you know, the carbon pricing and you mentioned, you know, companies are, are a bit hesitant, even though, you know, consumers may want to pay for it. Uh, so there, there's a question from Ryan Westrom. So he says, if companies are not willing to price in the costs of inefficient ordering or delivery, is there a needed role for policy regulation? Because how else do we get sustainability? You know, if everybody's just ordering ad hocly, you know, companies are subsidizing this and, you know, just wanting more consumption. So, you know, how do we make this more sustainable? You know, that it, it, I know it's a, it's a loaded question, but... Yeah. Let's say, I mean, it, it's more of a personal opinion, but from all I've seen in my work in this field so far, regulation usually doesn't fix the problem. In many cases, regu cases regulation just makes it worse. Um, so I think the question is rather, how can we accept the fact that humans are imperfect and that humans do order the toilet paper five minutes after they place their other Amazon order because they just realized they're running out of toilet paper. So this is just human behavior that's not going to go away whether you penalize it or not. Um, so the question rather is how can we make the logistic systems that have to deal with this more flexible? And obviously a lot of that has to come from the companies who operate these systems. So that's why to stick with this example, folks like Amazon and others invest a lot of people, a lot of money into coming up with better algorithms to actually predict this type of behavior. So that even though you as an individual consumer might have a completely erratic ordering pattern, they can somehow anticipate that and pre-position inventory more effectively such that the environmental impact of that might be limited. So for instance, such that even though you place five different orders throughout the day, you still only get to one delivery. That's what the companies need to do on the algorithmic side, quite frankly. But a city could, for instance, think about, well, how can we provide the right infrastructure for more flexible and more sustainable delivery options? So a big question, topic in this space, for instance, is unattended delivery. Because one of the main reasons for highly fragmented deliveries right now is that most of the deliveries still go to the individual home, to the individual address. And that comes with its own challenges. So can we create spaces within a city where we can do safe but unattended deliveries, safe and unattended kind of pickups to basically decouple the availability of the consumer from the actual delivery process? Because that will then enable the companies again to more easily consolidate loads, consolidate shipments, consolidate routes, because you're relaxing some of the constraints on their routing problem, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah so... so I, I see 
more potentially in enabling rather than restricting. So I get the point that consolidated deliveries can, you know, help it make more sustainable. So uh, let me pose the question of food deliveries. You know, there's this bad image of, you know, a whole car moving around with a small package of food to be delivered to somebody in the city. So uh, this is the question from Michael Leong. So, you know, where is the consolidation happening there? You know, it's spending so much time in urban traffic, you know, they are double parking all over, you know, Copley Square in Boston. And uh, so, and, and this is this is an increasing trend where it's, it's, it's getting worse with, you know, as time progresses. So, yeah. and you, you said you worked on food delivery as well. So where does the, the question of consolidated delivery come in, you know, where, in, in, in the case of food delivery? Yeah, um, and we worked on food delivery in an Indian context, um, which is from a traffic point of view even crazier than anything that we know in the US, for instance. More unsafe. Yes, more unsafe, much more congested. Um, and here, I mean, again, I think it's very hard to change consumer behavior. I don't think a regulator, even if they wanted to, could keep people from ordering stuff on, I don't know, Uber Eats or DoorDash or I don't know how they are called. So, um, you're not going to change the demand side that easily unless you impose very heavy economic disincentives and that's hard to do at least in a market like the us it's probably even impossible so the question really is what what needs to happen to keep up with this demand but require fewer resources so again a lot of it goes and that's what we worked on with the indian food delivery network for instance how can we make these deliveries more efficient how can we build better algorithms so that it's not just this one order going around on a single vehicle but maybe four or five so how can we connect multiple orders multiple customers and in this case also multiple restaurants on a somewhat consolidated route obviously the potential for improvement there is limited because of the heavy time constraints on this but it's an important lever because right now we see too many cases where it's still just the one order per vehicle and you can definitely do better than that the other side again is about um infrastructure so for instance I think Boston is a great example for this. Um, Boston is investing relatively heavily in safe bike infrastructure, biking infrastructure, for instance, because for food delivery networks in particular, if they can take it off a motorized vehicle, so if it's not a car or a van or whatever, they will, because bikes will always be more efficient in doing this than cars. The reason why that it's sometimes not possible is there's not enough safe infrastructure for people to do this on bikes, or uh, it's just not a very bikeable city in general. So um, again, that's where probably a city could say more, okay, how do we accommodate this trend by creating sufficient and safe infrastructure to, to make this less disruptive and also less, let's say, polluting um, um, while we will not change consumer behavior. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah, Matthias, Matthias Winkenbach, the head of the MIT Megacity Logistics Lab and the MIT Cave Lab, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Matthias, we're going to share the chat. You know, Robin Chase, for example, had some very interesting comments. Uh, I always find the chat file very interesting to read, uh, but thank you so much for your, for your contribution today. Thank you. Sure. And uh, 